born in 1898 of Sicilian parents. His birth name was Vincenzo D'Ambrosio. His parents had come to the United States in one of the earliest waves of Italian immigration, eventually settling in Chicago. He served in the Navy, and after he was discharged, he returned to the Windy City and began committing petty crimes, robbing pushcarts and breaking open payphones to steal the money. He later took up with his childhood friend Dini O'Banion and his crew of safe crackers, which included Earl Jaime Weiss and George Bugs Moran. Lawrence Burgreen, in his book, Capone, The Man and the Era, writes, Drucci had a streak of recklessness and daring, and he looked the part of a gangster. Tough, dark, and menacing, his expression frozen in a tragic mask, topped by wild unkept hair, and a face to haunt the dreams of his enemies. When prohibition became the law of the land, the gang moved into bootlegging in a big way, taking over all the liquor trade in the 42nd and 43rd wards. J. Robert Nash writes, Drucci was deadly, with wild ideas of killing all rival gangsters in Chicago, which earned him the nickname, The Schemer. But to those that knew him, he was considered a jokester. He loved pulling pranks on friends and innocent bystanders who were unlucky enough to cross his path. One episode has him dressed as a priest on the sidewalk, and as a couple walks by, Drucci blurts out, You have a nice ass! As soon as the couple would turn around to face the insulting Drucci, he would blurt out, Not you, lady, your fellow. Once in wintertime, Drucci went out back of the flower shop and filled a driver's car full of snow. When the unsuspecting driver came out back to see his car, he was left in total shock. Drucci had shoveled snow inside his car right to the top. When learning of this, O'Banion laughed his head off. But all was not fun and games and Drucci could be as deadly as he was fun-loving. When war broke out with the Southsiders, especially the Jenna brothers, who controlled all the rackets in Chicago's Little Italy, Drucci became a top enforcer for O'Banion's Northside gang. The Jenna brothers were selling their extra alcohol at cut-rate prices on the North Side, which was O'Banion territory. And just a year earlier, Torrio had called a gangland summit to mark home turf for each crew, hoping this would help keep the peace. And now the Jinnas had broken the agreement, and O'Banion went to Johnny Torrio and Unioni Siciliana boss Mike Merlo to get the Jinnas to back down. For reasons unknown, Torrio refused, and so O'Banion and his gang began hijacking shipments of whiskey that belonged to the Jinna brothers as a way to get even. But the Jenners were not going to take this lying down. Each side began upping the ante until the shooting finally started, and then all hell broke loose on the streets of Chicago. The war reached its first peak when O'Banion was gunned down on orders from the Jenners with the blessing of Torrio on November 10, 1924, inside Schofield's florist. Leadership then fell to O'Banion's second-in-command, Earl Jaime Weiss. Why swore revenge for the killing of his friend and boss, and he went after the Torrio Capone mob with a vengeance. The gang, including Drucci, ambushed Capone, shooting up his car, but failing to kill him. A few days later, on January 27th, Drucci and two other Northsiders ambushed Torrio, who had just returned from shopping with his wife. Severely wounded, Torrio survived the attack. But the close call with death was enough for Torrio. He handed all of his rackets over to Capone and left Chicago never to return. But the Northsiders weren't satisfied. On May 25th, Drucci, Weiss, and Moran killed Southside ally Bloody Angelo Jenna. And two months later, Drucci and a second gunman murdered Anthony Jenna. Capone thought Drucci was the deadliest of his Northside opponents, and the schemer lived up to his lethal reputation time and again. Drucci's willingness to draw his gun and wade through the ranks of rival gangsters caused newsmen to dub him the shootin' fool. As time went on, the war continued to worsen, with neither side gaining the upper hand, and Capone seethed with anger as he watched his men fall at the hands of Vincent Drucci. Drucci was credited by Chicago police with the killing of a dozen men, including Jenna mobsters, 
Giuseppe the Cavalier Nerone and Sam Samuts Amatuna on November 13, 1925. And with the intention of adding insult to injury, Drucci sent a huge floral piece to his victim's funeral, purchased, of course, at a discount from the florist shop owned by O'Banion. On August 10, 1926, Drucci and Weiss were ambushed by Southside gunmen on a Chicago street. Both men were uninjured. Five days later, the Capone gang tried again to whack their rivals, but once more, they escaped unharmed. In retaliation, the Northside gang pulled off one of the boldest hits in the history of organized crime. They conducted a massive raid on Capone headquarters in Cicero at the Hawthorne Hotel. It was a chilly afternoon on September 20th, 1926. Al was sitting in the Hawthorne when an armed convoy of touring cars drove by the establishment and sprayed it with thousands of bullets. The last car stopped and Drucci, Weiss, Moran, and a few others got out and stood in defiance, spraying the lobby and restaurant of the Hawthorne with bullets. Although shaken up by the attack, Capone was unhurt. On October 11th, Southside gunmen finally succeeded in killing Weiss outside of the Holy Name Cathedral in Chicago. With Jaime gone, Drucci and Moran assumed leadership of the Northside gang, but Big Al now had the upper hand and he wanted both men dead. During his criminal career, Drucci was constantly picked up by police for numerous crimes. He had been arrested over 10 times for illegally carrying a concealed weapon. And April 4, 1927, seemed like another day in the life of the schemer. Drucci and two associates were again picked up on a weapons charge and taken to the courthouse by Chicago police detective Dan Healy. Healy had a reputation for not taking gruff from anyone, especially a gangster. Drucci, on the other hand, didn't like to be manhandled. Healy grabbed Drucci by the arm, pushing him along as they entered the courthouse. Drucci objected and threw out an insult about Healy, who responded by slapping the lethal gangster in the face. He then pulled out his service revolver, thrusting it in his side and giving the Northsider a stern warning. After they left the courthouse, the argument continued, and what happened next was and is still a matter of dispute. Policemen who had been present during the incident supported Healy's versions of events. That Drucci, while announcing his intention for the detective, had lunged for Healy's gun, but Healy had drawn back and accidentally shot Drucci. The two associates who had been arrested with Drucci gave a very different account, asserting that a scuffle started after Healy punched Drucci, causing the driver to halt the car at a roadside, whereupon Healy got out on the running board before drawing and firing at Drucci, who was shot while sitting in the police cruiser with his hands cuffed. Whichever account is true, Drucci was fatally wounded with a bullet lodged in his abdomen. He collapsed without saying a word, dying on the floor of the car. Like so many during that time, Drucci received a lavish funeral and was buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. And his funeral, well, it was definitely one for the record books. His silver casket cost $10,000 and more than $30,000 in flowers adorn the funeral home. Detective Healy's account of the death of Vincent the schemer Drucci was accepted by authorities, and Drucci's death was ruled an accident.